that at certain times of the year, based upon our orbit around the sun and our alignment with the moon and other planets in the solar system, creates windows of opportunity by which the power that he used to do the miraculous was easier to access and utilize. Okay guys, well this is pretty cool actually. What we're looking at here is a picture of the heat signatures on two of Saturn's moons, Mimus and Tethys. And I really love this photo because it shows me a very unusual geometric shape here. We can quite clearly see that this looks like a part of a triangle. Now unfortunately, the article in regards to this appears on space.com which is connected to NASA and the best they can do is try and tell us that this looks like Pac-Man. In fact, they have mentioned Pac-Man about 20 times throughout this article. Not once do they mention it looks like a triangle or at the very least the top of a triangle or the top of a pyramid. Not once do they mention that it looks like a very unusual geometric shape with very straight lines. They just continually tell us that it looks like Pac-Man. So to me this really does show me they have nothing but contempt and treat us like idiots. Now interestingly the first heat signature here was discovered in 2010 and then they discovered this one in 2011. Now it goes on to say at the end of the article that the surface oddity was first sighted by NASA's Voyager spacecraft in 1980. But they don't say if it looked like this, they just say that it was an oddity. They don't say if it's changed since when they first saw this in 1980. They don't tell us whether this heat signature has been experiencing a lot of differences during the times that they have first actually seen this. So, you know, once again, we don't get very much information from NASA at all, but really we shouldn't expect anything, you know, more from NASA. They are the mouthpiece of these government agencies. But anyway, I thought it was very interesting, this shape, because as soon as I saw this shape, I actually didn't see Pac-Man. What I saw, was what I've been seeing on the sun, these triangles. So I find it really interesting that this geometry seems to keep turning up again and again. And you know, we also see that at one of Saturn's poles, there's a hexagram. So once again, we see this very unusual geometry with Saturn. So you think that that would actually rate a mention with NASA? Obviously it doesn't. Now I just wanted to show you this really unusual correspondence to one of Saturn's moons, uh, this one here, Mimith, and George Lucas's Death Star. And the reason that I find this really interesting is one, they do mention it in the article, but two, now that we're starting to see that there is a definite 
connection between people that are very creative and their ability to tap into universal consciousness. I think we should start paying attention to a lot more of these very creative types of people and what they were relaying to us. So if you get in a big pile of uh, crystal uh, uh, quartz type rock outcropping and you sit there and there's a big uh, electrical event going on inside the earth, the rocks will act like speakers and you'll hear the sounds. It's got to be quiet, real quiet, but you can hear them. They make they make they re, they change their shape uh, to uh, decide depending upon the electric field they're in. You put electrostatic field on a rock, it changes its shape. If you change its shape, it produces an electrostatic field. Okay, so. You're standing there, and what have you noticed? That the wire is being pulled by something in the stone. By something in the stone. Yeah. And we've looked up here, and we've actually found a mark in the stone of a fairly sizable bolt. Yeah. yeah. Isn't big it? Bolt. A yeah. big bolt. And this is right on the crescent moon of Edge right under, right in the center of us, and right below this chair, which is where the first abnormality of this rod was taking place. We also found a very strong pull to just about eight feet from that post in alignment with those, um, what would you, condominiums, some description, apartments, and uh, and just around the corner here, what did we find when you ran the wire again? We came around the side where the pool is in the north compass. We aligned it to the north compass, didn't we? Yes. And, uh, oh, by the way, it's Peter from Atmospheric Ionization. And what else did we find here? It's we aligned it and we actually found a hole. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody's left a Valentine's love message in there, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and this is right underneath, on the outside wall of this triangular cube space. And it aligned it directly to this centre hole. Is yeah. that close? Yeah. Tell me again, yeah. what, what did it do? It lined up with the, the hole. Did it? Yes. It really pulls itself towards that centre yeah. hole. Okay. And then we walked around the around the perimeter, didn't we? Yeah. We took off across and followed the wire. 
But the wire's doing all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. And how did you know to start doing this? You can feel it, and it, it, pulls, it pulls my hands when it does that, and it also points in certain directions. Right, okay. So you just follow and walk the direction? Yes. Okay, let's go. See what happens when we walk this way. Let me just come out to the top. And it's turning again. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, isn't that interesting? Same location. Let's keep going. Right the way around. It hasn't straightened up yet. Yeah, it's, it's still pointing back towards that. Is it? So it's a very strong pull? Yes. Okay, so now it's letting itself go. Is that correct? Yes. It's, okay. It's, it's not... Strong. And it's now aligning itself. Good? Yes. Yep. And turned away or turned around again. Hold it way out in front of you again, but it's pointing towards water. Okay. So we know that. Keep walking. Right the way around. Just want to see what happens when we go right the way around the other side. Just I'll relax your arm down a little bit. Just bend your elbow back towards your yeah. And just let it sit out there. Okay, I'm just gonna walk in front of you. I just want to come, follow me. This is the, the quarry. I just want to see you walk right up past this place here. And just follow the wire. Did it push away? It did just displace it. Oh. It is. Okay, yeah. just go back and follow the wire. Pulling you there. Walk this way. And now there. Yeah. Stop, look down. Oh. <laughs> I wonder what that is. Wow. Looks like an earth pin that Ed put there. This was his original, or possibly one of the original posts that he used to ground and make a mark for. Oh, wow. oh by the way, if we look up, we get an alignment with the north see that uh, the north polar star right back over this way yes okay so he lined that up with that as well Is the sun actually, do you believe, combusting in our itself? Not burning anything. There's no fusion in the sun. That's well understood. Prove it. Yeah, well, there's just not the way to prove that there is any. It's only in the flares do you get fusion. That's why all the x-rays, the flares, the arcs, and the x-rays, and the microwaves, and whatever result of fusion in the arcs. It's, there's no fusion in the sun. They don't know how the sun works. Why do you, what's special, how does the sun make like it's a transformer. Transforms from some other dimension. It's not burning anything. It doesn't have to. It's a converter. Of what? I don't know. Nobody knows. But that's what it does. That's the only thing it can do because that's how everything works. Transforming from another dimension. Yeah, you can say it's taking energy from another dimension, counter space.
can't go back, can I? No. But if you could, would you really want to? I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be the truth. You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? I know exactly what you mean. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. I do get knuckleheads on here that watch one video and because they don't get it then they, they you know they've got all the answers <clears throat> you don't just get all the answers I bet I don't I bet I don't even know one one hundredth of a percent of what's going on um, I know that there's one major thing involved and that's that thing that's called Saturn this is one of the biggest lies that comes out of the Bible because it's not a lie if you understand what it is but it's a lie the way it was taught to you you're told for those of you that are churchgoers and for you that, of those who aren't, you'll know what the word is. Sin, S-I-N. The word sin is supposed to mean that you're bad and that because you're sinful, God can't have anything to do with you. you know, well, the word God refers to the planet Saturn. It does not refer to the creator who stands above the one that men have called God, which is the planet Saturn. The word sin, 
uh, comes from it's 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 from physics. It's it's uh, used in quantum physics. What is quantum physics? Quantum physics has a very old ancient name, and that name is Kabbalah. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. As a scholar, the most amazing thing of all is the degree to which modern astrophysics sounds like a Kabbalistic Albert Einstein, when he was creating the atomic bomb or writing up the theory for it to work, uh, used Kabbalah. Came up with E equals MC squared. You got what? E, what, five, five, uh, five symbols that equal volumes of information. These, these are, are lies that have been perpetuated. People do not understand that the Old Testament is written in code. And I'm not talking about this bullshit Da Vinci Code crap. I'm talking about actual code as in, uh, you know, uh, high-level physics. Okay? The word sin, S-I-N, comes from the word sine, S-I-N-E. If you look at that, this is a sine wave. Yeah? It's a sine wave. The straight line that you're seeing, that's called linear time. That's going from your birth to your death, okay? The wavy line, that's a sine wave, okay? That's a sine wave. Bear with me. The word sine in physics is abbreviated as sin, okay? Now, there is another wave, it's gonna be in blue, that runs along the same, the same line as time, okay? And what that is, is it goes like this, this one is called a cosine wave, as in cosiner. That's right where that comes from. That's a cosine because it rides the back. It's so tight to the other wave, it's called a cosine wave. Now, you see, you have red and blue, and they both are interacting with time. So, one is time, one is space, okay? Those two together create time and space. Red and blue, which, which represents the planet Saturn. Uh, the time and space, so why, why is sin evil? Because sin is the abbreviation for sign which represents time. And incidentally, incidentally, the serpent in the garden is right here, okay? That's the, that's the serpent, okay? The serpent is time. Now I'm going to show you something else. Bear with me for a second. This is where your caduceus comes from. That's time and space running along a linear, that's a cosine and a sine wave, running around, along the vertical line, which is sine or sin. Here we have the wings. That's what your symbol is that you see, the caduceus. The single one is just the snake, which is the, it looks like an S. That's the serpent. Okay, so why, why do they say that we're sinful? They say that we're sinful or that you're born of natural sin because you're born into sine. You're, you're born into sign. You're born into time. And when you're born into time, when you're born into sign, you're born into sin. Now, why does sin keep you away from the Creator? Why? Because here, that's ruled by time, the circle, and space, the square, the Creator is timeless. There is no time where He exists. It's a loop. You go around and around and around. You have to arise above that and get to where there is no time. So when they say, oh, man's born of natural sin, you are born into the third dimension. And as the Bible says, the wages, the wages of sin is death. When you're born into the third dimension, you live in the third dimension. And as we all know, time, given enough of it, destroys everything. Okay? That's why in Revelations, the beast is Saturn. Because it regulates time. Given enough of it, it will kill you, your friends, your pets, destroy, rust, break down everything in the third dimensional level. And death is always associated with sadness and wailing and gnashing of teeth.
Because, see, they took a story of physics and they twisted it and they came up with a bullshit story that some broad, you know, running around in her birthday suit, you know, giggling and ate an apple she wasn't supposed to. The tree of life that they're referring to in Genesis is the Kabbalistic tree of life. First of all, the Old Testament was never supposed to be in your, in your possession. The Jews did not, did not want that out because those stories are coded stories that are written in high physics. All the Old Testament is is stories about reflections, light waves, uh, atomic weights, dates, uh, what else, vibrations, mathematical codes that are what that thing up in the sky creates that makes the, makes the reality that we live in. So for all intents and purposes that thing is God to this planet, not to me. I believe in the, the guy that's above him. Problem is we don't know what his name is. So that's why I believe in Jesus. It's the only guy in between me and the Creator. Okay, let's let's watch the graph here. You see how it goes round and round? You see the green? Okay, you see that's the serpent that's in the Garden of Eden. Okay, you see it? You see how it make that's sine wave? See that? Okay, you see, you see how that works? Okay, now we're gonna move on. I want you to look look. I want you to look at the equation and this is going to explain to you why I know that this is bullshit out of the Bible what they're talking about the Bible is not bullshit but the way that they crafted the story and made you think of something else is and on top of that when you're trying to explain physics to a guy you know that doesn't understand physics you have to use other means and that's why they use the story of the Garden of Eden so let's look look at the way it's written okay there's three axis points there all right which is what creates the cube all right, but let's look at it. This is interesting. Why am I going to go? Why Why am I going to go to hell when I die? Look what's in parentheses. Cause I sin. Do you see? They just crafted a story from a from from physics, and they did that because back in the old days, like I said, in order to get the message across to somebody, you put it in a story form. Okay. This is what this is all about. There's no doubt in my mind. Just, okay, here we have a woman with an hourglass, yeah? Okay? She's got her arm resting on a skull, which represents death. The thing that's above her head is called Oribus. It's a snake biting its tail, okay? That represents Saturn, okay? All halos that you see represent Saturn. All circles, the earrings that you wear, women, those earrings are a representation of time, and they're... And, it comes out of Babylonia. It represents Saturn. Same thing with your wedding ring. Uh, this is obviously a picture from a society called the Roscrucians, which is, I guess, they're kind of like Masons. That's why she's holding a rose. But the hourglass and the Oribus above her head. So this is basically telling you that it, it, Eve, okay, the story of Adam and Eve, it was time. That was time. It wasn't a serpent as in a snake. It was a serpent as far as time. A sine wave. Okay? All right. You see it go around and around? You see the red colors? Red, yellow, blue, green? That's a time cube. But if we look at it, look how it's split into four sections. The circle is, right? Okay. Let's see where we've seen that before. Ah, there you go. There it is. You see, it's on top of a church. It represents time and space. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with saving your soul. It has everything to do with a business. The, uh, the 503, it's a government code. Churches don't pay taxes because it's nothing more than a government installation. And pretty much that's, that's all that I really wanted to show you guys today. I guess there's a plan for all of us. I had to die. Twice. Just to figure that out. Like the book says, he works his work in mysterious ways. Some people like it. Some people don't.
why do the people think they know things and talk about how others don't know anything? Why is it so easy to get people to call other people sheep? Is that not just the new underground pop thing to say? You have homophobia, this could be sheepophobia. Everybody calls everybody else a sheep. They talk about how they're awake. People believe that if they watch a six-hour video by David Icke, or watch Endgame by Alex Jones, or study the Illuminati online, they believe that after doing so, that that has anything, in any way, to do with being awake. They believe it. I'm not kidding. They can't get enough. Addicted to posting their opinion in a forum. Chasing that white rabbit everywhere it goes. And they call themselves awake because the system wants you to call yourself awake. It loves that. Cockiness, arrogance, and hating other people. And as you're sucked into this, it is consuming you and you don't know it. You don't even realize it. You just prefer to be able to call people sheep. Perhaps subconsciously you resent that you were called a sheep. You want to be able to say it too. The naivety with that is that you don't know anything that they know. And they know you don't know it. You're not hurting their feelings. You're making them laugh at you. Because you're eating up mostly propaganda that they have distributed. Calling yourself awake and pointing your finger at them. And you are hardly enabled to deal with them or even your own self. John, tell me why. John, give me, give me, give me. John, tell me another answer, please. And can you answer this question for me? And what's your opinion on that? You owe me a response. I owe you a response? How much am I getting paid to do this? Oh, that's right. Nothing. I couldn't even count the number of people that have declared being awake to me. Couldn't do it. People are very easily controlled. All they have to do is create a new subcategory of personalities. Right now you have the jocks, you have the rednecks, you have the goth, you have the preppies, you have the business people and the whatever. Now they have the awake people. The reason nobody knows anything can only be explained to you by a metaphor, of course. In this realm you can only use metaphor. Think of the difference between a broadband connection and a 56K connection. Now there are people that know what is occurring in this reality. Many of them joined secret societies. So it's not that they have knowledge, it's just that they have acquired information. They went in reverse. You see, true knowledge is true knowledge. Those with understanding understand what I just said, those without don't. It's pre-symbol. A symbol is no different than any expression, a song, a picture, a sound, a look, a touch. A symbol should be the result of knowledge. The understanding, the awareness, and then you have the symbol surface. Having somebody learn symbols and then distributing a very strategically limited amount of meaning to that person does not give them knowledge. They perceive that they're getting knowledge. For example, I could say the word gum to some bubblegum popping dizzy minded cheerleader and the only meaning that she may come up with when she hears that word is chewing gum. I could say the same word gum to somebody else and they may think chewing gum but they could also think a gum tree or the gums around your teeth. Could say it to another person, they'll think chewing gum, a gum tree, gums around your teeth, but maybe they're thinking even deeper, maybe they have a deeper understanding. Metaphorical comparison to other things 
gummy substances used in construction. Maybe molecular assessment. I only used one word, a phonetic symbol, written if you're looking at it. The meaning transferred by using that symbol is directly dependent upon who is receiving the information. If it's the cheerleader, she's only going to get a very limited amount of understanding, just enough to communicate. The line by Gene Hackman in the first Superman, some people can extract the secrets of the universe just by looking at the ingredients on a chewing gum wrapper, is absolutely correct. What that means is you can get a lot of information just by being aware. The creases in the paper, the spacing between the letters, the letters themselves, the space around the letters, all the nuances. Now, unfortunately, I have to say that this is a metaphor, okay? A metaphor. That does not mean that you should go and try to learn as many meanings as you can for each word that you know. That would have nothing to do with anything. That was just a metaphor that I used. If you think of a symbol, and you look at maybe the shape of the number six, you can be told what that means. But perhaps if you're bathing in knowledge and awareness in life, suddenly you have an understanding and then a symbol like six comes up. Maybe you think of getting caught in a tumor and you come in but you can't get out and you're caught in a vortex, a circular cyclic existence, getting in, not getting out. Something like that, you know. What they do to you early is they show you all the symbols and tell you what they mean. And they don't tell you completely what they mean, of course. They tell you what they want you to think they mean. Why? Because what is the true purpose of being? If you're not extracting meaning from your path, from your experience, deriving meaning from it in creating expression, the expression would always be the symbolic. A picture, a touch, a kiss. Anything, an image, right? If you're only copying what they've told you things mean and replicating what they've told you to use them for and how to use them, how to speak, how to think, what means what, what you're supposed to do, what the meaning of your life is. If you allow yourself to be told what the meaning of your life is by something in your objective reality, somebody else, what is your purpose other than to be a slave? Forget about laws and politics, that's all bull. That's only a result. If you're not creating, and the only way you're going to create is by extracting meaning from within, if you can't do that, what is the point of you being around other than to be a slave? Acquiring detail. This means this. I learned what this symbol means. This pagan symbol means this. What do you mean you learned? Did you look it up? Were you told or did you read what it means? Or did you sit there by a lake and think about life as a whole and what's happening and the symbol came up and you're like, oh my gosh. See, the oh my gosh is when you extract meaning. It doesn't have to be a traumatic thing like, oh my gosh. It can be, oh my God. <gasps> that is the sign of a creative. Somebody that's always in their mind like, I get it, oh my gosh. And you want to tell the whole world. Because you've just created, you've extracted meaning from within. Those that even if they have opened up, all right, and they were seeking information because information is not knowledge. So enlightenment would be in the category of information. Why? Because as it's sold, as it ends up being, all you're doing is changing your perception of reality, just seeing other templates of symbolic expression. There are no answers there if you're depending upon anything you experience to give you those answers. So in truth, if you have the meaning inside and you 
come up with symbols and you see them in your objective reality, maybe somebody else came up with it too, you have an understanding, an immediate understanding. Sometimes that can be faked or replicated. Somebody's been indoctrinated into a system where they had to learn specific meanings to symbols. And so one who is in the know, one who has knowledge may run into somebody like that and the person may have learned enough so that you have an understanding. But the person that learned it will still look at you if you came from within to know in a way that, that they're curious. How do you know? Because you seem to have a different, uh, a fuller understanding of it, a non-polarized understanding of it. They learn a few specific ways to talk about it and what it means, but you can talk about it endlessly with different metaphors. What's the difference? Well, what's the difference between reading a book and memorizing somebody else's conclusions and extracting meaning and coming to your own? It's like the difference between a muffin top and a muffin. They've got you all eating up muffin tops but you don't have the knowledge underneath. Is that a permanent thing? Absolutely not. The reason you don't know anything is because many people that do have knowledge, even if they wanted to tell you, it's like they are on a broadband connection and you're on 56K. There is so much information. And unfortunately, as it is right now, the general population has no idea they look at a symbol, maybe they're taught a symbol. Either they really don't have any understanding of it, or it's a very limited understanding. If you have knowledge inside of you, you could sit there and talk about that one symbol all day. There's more than one meaning attached to symbols. Like I told you, a deer in the woods can mean more than one thing by stomping their hoof. If you seek the symbol, the muffin top, you will never have the whole muffin. And this is what people do when they try to seek videos and books and all. They're looking for muffin tops. They're looking for the end result. Therefore, you are dependent upon the meaning that is given to you. So somebody in the know, if they're talking to somebody that isn't in the know, can be very difficult. Why? Well, a very naive thing to say or if somebody's trying to manipulate you, control your mind, they'll say this, the truth is an easy thing to say. And anybody who speaks for a long time to you, they're trying to manipulate you. Now that's a very naive thing to say. Yes, somebody who depends upon a lot of words, really trying to control what you're thinking, could very well be trying to manipulate you. But if you depend upon length, of speech and that's where your perception lies you wouldn't be able to tell anyway if someone's trying to manipulate you you should pick up on that within seconds regardless of what they're saying the truth is something easy to say if one person in the know is speaking to another person in the know in other words you've both reached the same conclusions and you know it you know when other people know you just do. That's why they don't say anything other than that. You know when other people know. And you say, well, that's ambiguous. And that's ambiguous to you. But that is a symbol. To say that sentence, you know when other people know, that is a symbol. And those who have come to the conclusion on their own understand the full meaning of that. Those who may have heard that from some philosopher and they were told that that philosopher was brilliant, so they decided to dwell upon things the philosopher said. If a philosopher says to you, you just know, you just know when other people know, well, you trust that philosopher because everybody has given them a five-star rating. So you think, well, that must mean something. So I'm going to sit around and think about it. You can't sit around and think about that. That is a result of so much, so many experiences. So, if I say you just know when other people know, 
You don't have to sit around and assess and calculate in your mind and think of behavioral patterns or they said this and they said that. I'm going to put two and two together and formulate an assessment of them and what their intentions are. If you are doing that, that is robotic. It's nothing against you. If I were against you, I wouldn't be trying to help. It's the conclusion that matters. If you reach it on your own because a conclusion is a symbol it is a symbolic representation the quote the conclusion that has so much attached to it all of your experiences that tie in to the conclusion how do you extract meaning well perhaps you have an experience it could be a social experience it could be anything and that experience is finished and that means nothing to you. Then you have another experience and you see that it's different, but there's something similar to that other experience. You're kind of like, hmm. And then you have a third experience in your life and it's really similar now, all three of them. Then you have a fourth experience that solidifies the similarity and prompts a question. It is the fourth experience that prompted you to ask the question, but it required the other three preceding it. The fourth experience, if it were isolated in and of itself, would never have prompted it. You needed all four experiences. So now you have the question. And maybe you have a whole other series of experiences that are happening so that you can extract meaning to address the question. And maybe after all of that, you come to a conclusion. And now that conclusion propels you in your advancement of understanding and extracting meaning in your life and you start a whole other series of experiences and that's just one facet of your life and maybe simultaneously you have 30 other paths going like that like I just explained and maybe all 30 of them come to one peak of a conclusion and you need it all 30 paths that had many many experiences within each path leading up to minute conclusions that come together that lead you to a new understanding that takes time it takes attentiveness and the desire to have meaning to have purpose and now that one new understanding could be one of thousands that eventually tie in and you don't even know it right until you reach the <gasps> The, oh my gosh and all of these things come from within your ability to make use of pattern recognition to see how things are always and never the same what do they have in common did you get out there and experience people of different cultures were you too busy trying to project your culture onto them and see what they would say or were you trying to figure out what you had in common? I did that my whole life. In the moment of doing it, I didn't really necessarily know why I was motivated to do it. My spirit did, but my conscious mind didn't. Your spirit will lay breadcrumbs for you throughout your entire life or path. So if you come to an understanding, and then several understandings, and you know how much is involved with it. You can tell other people the details of your path, but that isn't their path. And if they try to memorize the details of your path, they're pulled off of their path. This is why I have been really careful not to give too much information about my path. People always ask me, tell me how this all began. And the details of my path are irrelevant the understanding is the important thing the conclusions I reach and I can share conclusions with you to motivate you but I can't have you memorize my conclusion so I have to have a delicate balance of rhetoric with the information and the information is not volumes of information it's enough to make my point clear it's enough to show you that I've learned but I don't want you to memorize the details of my life one who really cares for you will be attentive to that and the idea of indoctrinating somebody with an oath is absolute evil why because they're declaring they do not want you to be a creative being and extract your own meaning 
you will go through steps in which they will spoon feed you meaning and because it's more meaning than you had before more knowledge you're really impressed by it you think you're actually getting something you think that you're being empowered when they know that by keeping you from being able to extract meaning on your own they've got complete control over you they've pulled you off of your path but if they did that successfully you would never even have thought of that now would you because you won't extract your own meaning you see nevertheless somebody with a lot of knowledge if they're on a broadband connection and they're speaking to somebody in a 56k connection it's anything but easy to tell the truth like I said before one in the know can say the truth very easily to another in the know if one in the know is speaking to an individual that is not in the know saying the truth is anything but easy why because of what you know you know of the enormous gaps that they have that you cannot just say the truth because they'll understand the words with the limited understanding they have in their concept building by society but they would need to go through so much and you know that they don't believe that telling them that makes no sense to them they say the truth is simple you should be able to give me a simple answer and then what happens is the people that have knowledge get very frustrated the very moment you interrupt them or cut off what they're saying to you when they have to extend great patience to try to tell you the truth and you cut them off and want to give them your opinion or you tell them that you agree with them or disagree to somebody in the know when they're speaking to somebody that is not in the know when the person that is not in the know says that they agree or disagree both of those things are offensive because they know you should just have your mouth shut and take in what they're saying and a lot of what they're saying will be rhetoric but I talk to people like this all the time they completely ignore the rhetoric I'll use rhetoric that if they had wisdom they would understand at least okay there's something with this and they blow it off they go yeah but anyway but I, and then I blow them off and they have no idea why I blew them off or people will just bombard me with questions questions that are what you call loaded anybody in the know would say that's a loaded question because you lack you lack so much just in the fact that you're asking those questions shows how much you don't know and you ask them in a very naive way it's not your fault but you expect a simple answer people will go up to somebody with knowledge that has required an entire lifetime of attentive awareness to their experiences detailed and disciplined effort to extract meaning from your life and they ask you a simple question and expect somehow that you are going to be able to transfer a lifetime of understanding in two or three paragraphs they truly do they do expect that otherwise they wouldn't ask the question so you have this huge gap between those who are in the know and those who are not in the know those who are not in the know do not know they're not in the know because of how they have been taught to think they have been incorrectly instructed in their thinking process itself they have been taught to look outside of themselves for answers they have been misinformed about what answers are because they've spent their whole life having the meaning spoon-fed to them they think that's how it works so you ask a question and somebody can spoon feed you the answer and because you lack any meaning or an understanding you don't understand why that answer is wrong limited or even misleading you you can't based upon that based upon how you've been instructed to think so a lot of people that have knowledge 
when they interact with the average person they get very very frustrated very they'll just look at you all they can do is look at you because they can't say anything to you you would not be able to extract meaning from what they say they said gum all you would do is hear chewing gum and they're thinking 500 different meanings to gum all leading up to a point of conclusion if you lack that it's a waste of time to tell you anything this is why when you hear someone tell you that you cannot be told the truth this is why so they'll look at you and they'll have that look and those in the know understand that look it's a look that says you know so little you know absolutely nothing and don't know it to tell you what I know I would need 500 mouths and have to be able to speak 500 different sentences simultaneously all at the same time to express what I know and you would have to be able to interpret 500 simultaneous sentences flowing at you at once that's what that look says and the look also says you don't even know that and if I told you that you would call me arrogant because you've been trained to call people arrogant you don't even know what that means so they'll just sit there and shake their head at you they shake their head from side to side because they're paralyzed it's the questions you ask the way that you ask the questions and what you do if they actually try to answer them how long does it take before you cut them off roll your eyes or get distracted by something that occurs in the room like a cat being distracted by bright and shiny objects and if they're trying to tell you something and maybe your cell phone will ring and you'll tell the person trying to give you truth to hang on Shelly has to talk about her boyfriend okay hey you're not gonna get the truth you're nowhere near prepared to even comprehend anything that is true and then you say come on just tell me you can't be told well that doesn't make sense all you have to do is tell me you can't be told not in your current state you need a lot of work and you don't understand why you need a lot of work that's what it comes down to now nothing is a hundred percent am I saying that every Freemason has been spoon-fed no there's a lot of intuitive people that probably joined that but they were naive enough to be sucked in but some of these people may want to tell the world things maybe they thought you know this isn't fair I, I gotta tell them what's going on and they tried maybe they tried with a few people but they got the rolling of the eyes or the person that they knew knew nothing tried to debate them they're so far out of the know that they can't even recognize truth when it's told to them do you know that the majority of the people that look up information on the Illuminati point their fingers at people in the Illuminati if you actually sat down in a room with these people and were allowed to ask them questions and they had to be honest with you if they told you the truth you either wouldn't understand or you would roll your eyes you would laugh at them I know enough to know that a problem with somebody in an organization like that is not only are they separated from you they're separated from you because they cannot relate to you because what you think is is not what they think is that's first and foremost and that's by design by that which sucked them into it they're also controlled by an oath with fear and it's not just fear of death they'll use threats of the unknown because these people are shown different templates of reality and they say we control that too so if you do this it's not over when you die we'll get you here here and here and they don't know any difference they can't prove that that isn't happening that that won't happen that's the fear of the unknown when are you subjected to the fear of the unknown when you look outside of yourself for meaning they are answering to a consciousness 
that overwhelms them. It can speak through anyone, they know it. If they want to ask it a question, they can look in a cloud. So that can be overwhelming for them, and I understand that. My intent is not to point my finger at anybody or anything on any scale. People in these societies are sucked in, then they're blackmailed. Because even though they believe they have all of this knowledge, some of it is filtered in their mind by the consciousness that controls their minds. So they don't think about certain things. Controlling of their mind to make them deviate in a way that society would want to pick up stones and throw them at them. Because society is corrupt too, that's why they're so judgmental. These people are scared of that type of persecution. I understand that. I'm not going to point my finger at them for being scared of it. Rather, I would like to go through it in some ways myself and show them that it's worth it. And show them their own value. I want to show everybody value. I'm not polarized here. Because that's what's in my heart. If I feel like a healer, how could I look at somebody with a disease and just focus on their behavior and be too stupid to recognize that their behavior is a result of a condition? Now, if I have true wisdom, wouldn't I address the condition? I would only focus on somebody's conduct throughout their life if I had a very small mind and had no capabilities, no abilities, no talent, no gift to give no ability to create my desire is to heal both myself and everything I see and not carry the whole world on my shoulders when I do it but rather be moment to moment since everybody else is ignoring the problem the majority and I say wait a minute you know that person doesn't have to be that way they don't have to be corrupt, and I know it because I've watched my own corruption get healed. So if it can happen for me, I know it can happen for somebody else. I would be what you call a fool. You know, the one that comes in with the hat and the bells? I would be a fool to blind myself to the whole picture and not take everything into account. That includes my own behavior, my own path. Because that's where I'm going to get any knowledge from anyway.
different, only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. 